and then we'll, we'll field some questions. Father in heaven, we are thankful for a beautiful Sunday morning and the privilege we have to gather in the way that we are this morning. Father, we are so thankful for what you have revealed to us and are revealing to us. We're thankful, Father, that eternal life is in knowing you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we come to rejoice in that, and I pray that you'll just bless us as we interact. We do thank you, Father, for what you'll do in our midst this morning. We give you praise and glory and honor through the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So just a little explanation of what we're going to do this morning. Um, we are going to put up a phone number, I believe, so that those um, by way of the internet that have questions, comments for the panel, they can share those. They'll come to my phone and I'll pass them along. But uh, we're going to just get into discussing the historic Jesus. Who is Jesus? And uh, I was thinking that uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians was willing to forego everything that he might know Jesus, the power of his resurrection, fellowship with his suffering. Your sound on and off, maybe. It's it changed, it, it did changed. change, yeah. Do I still have it? <laughs> Do I need to repeat that or am I still good? Pardon me? Minor technical difficulties. Are we still good? Okay. She'll have to give me her phone. We'll work that out. All right, wherever it was we were, as far as the price paid to know the real Jesus, and I know some of you paid a pretty high price, uh, but I know it's your passion to know him, not only doctrinally, but experientially. And uh, I, I guess from there, I just want to uh, go to whoever wants to speak to the issue first about the real Jesus, your discovery of him, um, your thoughts concerning it. So with that said, I'll turn it over to our panel. I have on my computer, just to the right, a little sheet by Kermit called The Real Jesus. And in that, he lists like 37 things. And this is what I hand out to anyone who asks me the question. Kermit has summarized this, check it out. And so I think that's fantastic, you know. And he lists things like, uh, only God has immortality, but Jesus died, and things like that. What else do you have on that, Kermit? Yeah, um, boy, just uh, a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> it, uh, I wish I had it in front of me. I've actually got it in the back here, if anybody wanna pick, wants to pick one up for free. Uh, I just briefly, uh, lay out our belief that uh, Jesus is a man, that he's not God, and the Bible doesn't say he's God. Um, I don't get into the, all of the main texts that the traditionalists would cite to uh, say mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, Jesus is God, like John 1, 1, C, and uh, Romans 9, 5, and Titus 2, 13, and those texts. Uh, but I say things like that. Yeah. God, is yeah. a, God is immortal, and Jesus died. Yeah. In Israel, Bill, you lived with a Messianic community. Tell me a little more about how you came to emphasize more the Messiah aspect of, of Jesus. Yeah, that is interesting that... <clears throat> In the modern world, Christians, I think, are a bit misnamed because a Christian would be somebody that would believe that Jesus is the Christ, mm -hmm. the Messiah. And in the Bible, Messiah, Christ, is not God. It means to be anointed. Of God. Anointed of God. So. A better name for traditional Christianity probably would be, if you take the Greek word for God, theos, theos. it'd be called theosians or, or something like that. If we take the Latin word for God, deusians. Because for most Christians, it's not enough to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. You have to believe that he's God. 
So it is kind of ironic that that name, Christ, is misapplied yes. in, in modern times, or really for the yeah. last centuries it's been misapplied. But I think it's important, kind of going back to Steve's original question, and as you both have just stated that Jesus is a human being, it's really essential to understand that the Messiah Jesus is a human being, a human person. person. Because once you have a, the person, whoever the self of Jesus is, if you say that he is a pre-existent being, even an eter eternal God or one member of an eternal God, the person of whoever that is, is not human. Then you would have to say that he's only taking on human nature form. Yeah. or form or flesh, these kinds of ideas. They don't really like the idea of flesh. Hmm. They'll stay with it on John 1.14, Right? He became flesh, but pretty soon they'll talk about human nature assuming another nature. They use the word nature, which is more abstract. But for me, like in Philippians chapter 2, which is a go-to passage for many deity of Christ believers, those are actions of Christ Jesus. Have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Christ is the title of the human person. Jesus is the name of the human person. And if you want to say the humbling act that Paul is describing in Philippians chapter 2 was the act of a pre-existent divine being, mm. you see what you've done is you've taken away the glory, you could say, or the honor from the human person. Now the human person did nothing. Yeah. And there's, that's scary. A, there's an old heresy, and I use that term very cautiously, called docetism, and it goes back to Greek philosophy. And Sean Finnegan was talking about, in Greek philosophy, matter was evil, and our job was to escape matter. Well, that's not the theme of the Bible. So when the Greeks started, when, we, when Christians believed Jesus was born, the seed of the woman, the, the child of Mary, miraculously by the Holy Spirit, in flesh, then the Greeks go crazy. Oh, Jesus wasn't real then. And so docetism means to, he only seemed real. But to me, that's a facade that's absolutely hideous for Jesus. He died, he suffered, mm -hmm. he bled, he was, re <laughs> he was real. Mm -hmm. Another uh, point in my track there is that uh, Jesus was tempted. Mm showing that he was a human being. Uh, but James, Jesus' brother, wrote the book of James, or the letter of James in the New Testament, and he says therein, God cannot be tempted. So these are incongruous uh, statements. You know, the Gospels, Matthew, and Mark telling us that Jesus was tempted by the devil at the beginning of his public ministry. Uh, and those temptations must have been real. You know, that's an issue that scholars will debate whether it was real temptation or not real. And this is part of the reason why the title of my tract is The Real Jesus. Yeah, when, when Jesus is praying in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. There, there's two persons who have two wills there. And if he's not, uh, the Bible talks about sweating as it were drops of blood. This was an intense thing he was going through, a, a, a temptation to not do God's will, but to submit God's will. If it's not real, it's just a fake. <laughs> and to me, Christianity would be a, a, a falsehood if Jesus weren't real. Yeah. Another aspect of that is of the humanity of Jesus. The New Testament is saying that a human person has been raised from the dead. Mm. That God raised 
the man Christ, Messiah Jesus, from the dead. And that gives hope for the rest of us human beings. And that God has exalted the human being, the human person, Jesus of Nazareth, who was born of Mary, who I would assume drank milk and needed to be fed. That human person God has raised from the dead and exalted to a position at his right hand with angels and other authorities subject to him. That's the, in our participation in who Jesus is as a human person, that gives us hope and a perspective on life that really, we go to Psalm 8, what is man, that you are so mindful of him, you have crowned man with glory and honor, right? God has given to human beings through Jesus glory and honor mm. and put all things in subjection under him. So it fits well with the whole picture of the Old Testament about who is God and who are we as humankind and Jesus being our human representative, not a God-man. If he's a God-man, none of us are God-men. So if it's only a God-man that's exalted to the right hand of God, it doesn't, it doesn't really help us. Not really, but as a human being raised from the dead, that gives us hope. I don't, I don't think people realize how important it is when it says, God talking in his holy council, let us make man in our image. So we are in, what is the Latin, imago Dei, the image of God. We can think, we can reason, we have abstract thought. God made us different than my puppy at home. We are absolutely different. We have the unique possibility of choosing God or just rejecting God. We are in the image of God. When God says in Isaiah 1, Come, let us reason together. He's talking to humanity, human beings who have the capability of comprehending who God is. Romans 1 again. By creation, we're without excuse. So we, we are the epitome of this creation. Now, the angels were already created, and God has been in existence forever. No one knows. But we came into existence in the image of God, and this is a gift of God to have thought, free will, choice, to make a decision to love God. What do you think of that, Kermit? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's just amazing to understand that Jesus was a human being like us. Uh, the, primary difference being that he came into this world uh, through a virgin birth, mm -hmm. similar to Adam, and that's why Paul speaks of the second Adam in Romans, yes. uh, is that Romans 5? Mm. And, uh, 1 Corinthians, what, 14, 15? Uh, and so Paul is comparing Jesus and Adam and Adam failed the test, mm. but Jesus overcame sin and temptation and all of that, and uh, it's to his glory, and so he's honored, uh, like Bill says, sitting at the right hand of God, a human being sitting yes. at the right hand of God, absolutely amazing. And uh, one of my favorite themes in the Bible is the second coming of Christ. Mm, amen. When Jesus will bring the kingdom of God in all of its fullness and glory mm. and uh, then life here on the earth is going to be a lot better. Amen. Uh, it's interesting to me that you brought up the, the second Adam because after the first Adam sinned, uh, scholars call it the proto-euangelion, first good news. And that's in Genesis 3.15, where it says, the seed of the woman 
would crush the serpent's head. So we've fallen into sin, but there's someone coming who's going to get us out of sin, and it's a human being born of a woman. That's pretty cool. And then if you follow the line down to Genesis 12, 3, another major, major good news of Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, the descendant of Abraham would bless the whole world. And that's Jesus. Paul refers to that in Galatians 3. The gospel was preached. So it goes back to Adam's sin and the new Adam in Christ. That's a good point, mm -hmm. Kermit. Very good point. Got any thoughts about that? Say, men, do I dare break in and ask yeah. if anybody's got questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go I'm going to moderate it. I'm going to, I'll try to repeat the questions for the sake of the internet audience. Hey, I have a couple of questions for Bill. Uh, I'm curious about uh, the movement over there in Israel. Are there still Jews that believe there that believe Jesus is the Messiah? And if so, then what was that like for you as a Trinitarian? Was there any exchange of ideas there? Maybe repeat the question. All right. Maybe I'll try to repeat that question. So you're asking Bill and his experience in Israel, were there Jews who believed Jesus as the Messiah back in his Trinitarian uh, time? How, how did that work with him? If I'm yeah. getting the gist of your question. He is human and a Trinitarian doesn't. Okay. And you're there right in Israel, in the land. Well, there are Jews in the land of Israel, just like in other parts of the world, a minority, a small minority of Jews that would say they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. In, in Israel, you call them Mishichim, which is the word Messiah, like you would say in English, Christian. Most of those, the number in Israel varies. It has grown somewhat, uh, probably 10,000, 15,000 people maybe. There was a significant number of immigrants that came from Russia in the 1990s that had kind of a Christian background. So the number somewhat increased. What is that as a percentage of total? Uh, it's less than 1%. It's like 0.5 of a percent or something, of, out of 9 million people. Right? So 10, 15,000 out of 9 million people. So it's a small, small minority. But the, the influence for their understanding of who Jesus is, is from the West. It's from traditional Christianity, uh, evangelicalism, as somewhat, some Catholics and so forth, but mostly evangelical uh, streams of understanding. So though the, those Messianic Jews, by far, would identify more, they won't say they're Trinitarian, most of them would not, unless some have been educated in the States for higher graduate degrees, then they'll be more ready to say that God is a shilush, God is three. But most don't, most are confused. As I began to speak with Israeli believers, because I, I lived in, in the Messianic world, in a sense, in Israel. I knew many of the Messianic people. When I came to the understanding that God is one and Jesus is his human Messiah, I right away started to talk to people. Most are, they're very hesitant about saying they believe in the Trinity because that right away identifies them with the Catholic Church. You believe in the Trinity, you're, you're outside of Judaism. So if they don't use the language, even though you would press them and they'll, yeah, okay, uh, somehow God is the Father and God is the Son and God is the Spirit. They, won't, they don't like the term Trinity. And many are, I would say, toward what we call in the Christological realm, Arian. They would say that Jesus is somehow subordinate to the Father. A lot of them, and I see Kermit's holding uh, his book, The Restitution of Jesus Christ here, he's gone through some of the historical development of Christology. So a lot of the Messianics, I would say they're kind of back in the second century where Jesus was subordinate to God, but somehow he's still also divine, right? Many are, and they're, con they're confused because it is a confusing doctrine. Then there are a few that understand that Jesus is a real hu human person. And I'm hoping, I like to ask for prayer to have God open more Jews in Israel 
their eyes and their minds to understand, yeah, the Messiah. He's the Messiah. Because you can, and the Messianics, so using that term again, those that believe, the litmus test is the deity of Jesus somehow, right? If you can just say Jesus is God, leave it unclear what that really means, you're in with the Messianics. That's the litmus test. But I'm hoping that, and you can, here's, here's the, where they can be somewhat successful. You can go online and see people are looking at hundreds of thousands of hits of these YouTube that a couple of organizations in Israel make showing that Jesus is Messiah. Hmm. And there, you can make a good claim. Yes. You can, I yes. believe that. You can find that hmm. Jesus, the Messiah, as the apostles said, said, was to suffer and die and to rise from the dead. Now, for most of the Messianics that are making these videos, that's like a hook because that's not enough. If a person just believes Jesus is Messiah, that's not enough for them. You have to believe he's somehow God or divine. So I think, though, that we need the Jews. I really do. I really think if a number of Jews, especially Israelis, but even in, uh, Jews in the, in the diaspora outside of Israel, can come to this understanding and just tell the evangelical Christian world, look it, Stop with this nonsense that came from the second century and the third century about Jesus being a God-man and, you know, pre-existent being that somehow assumed human flesh. He's the Messiah, Amen. period. Yes. So, I don't, did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Question in the back. Yesterday, how do you rationalize that? How do you get through that? Yesterday, Kermit brought the point, the virgin birth made a difference. How did you say that yesterday, Kermit? You were talking about that. Well, as I understand it, the traditional understanding of the virgin birth uh, is that Jesus did not have what's called original sin. Um, because of the virgin birth. Now, you know, to talk about the mechanism in which that would have occurred and all that, uh, I don't get into that. But um, Adam was created not a sinner. You know, theologically, it's usually called he was created in innocence. So he didn't understand the difference between right and wrong. And so according to Genesis, the third chapter, the serpent uh, came and first deceived the woman. Uh, and the issue was about uh, understanding right and wrong. And so then when they took of the tree, they had an understanding of it, uh, but they became sinners. Uh, by taking of the fruit. Um, <clears throat> so that's how Paul says sin entered into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so before that, sin was not in God's creation, um, was not in this world. Um, and so uh, I have held to the traditional belief about original sin I haven't studied it enough, probably. Uh, St. Augustine was the one that expounded on it, uh, is known for expounding on it more than anybody else, so he has quite a teaching about it. Uh, but um, I have understood that everybody who is born a human being into this world inherits a sin nature because of original sin. 
but the virgin birth cut that off so that Jesus came into this world like Adam did without sin. There's a real cool verse that, that I, I just love, and my old professor Bill Wachtel pointed out, Matthew 11, 27. No one fully knows the son except the father. So how that virgin birth produced a non-sin nature human being, that's totally up to God how he did it. And that verb in there, no one fully knows the son except the father, is epigonosco. And that means really knows. So how God did it? I'm like, Kermit, I don't want to start speculating as to how that egg spirogenated Dr. Gene Davis from the old Phoenix Bible Church. You say that egg just spirogenated and God caused it to be a perfect human being. And that's, to me, gets away from that sin nature possibility to some extent. Mm -hmm. No one fully knows the details of that, but Jesus is special but he's still a human being. And, and the word monogonis, you know, you read Luke 3, <clears throat> Adam is a son of God. But John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. That means only birthed son. Adam is a dirt made son of God. Jesus is the only born son of God. And I think that is critical in our understanding of sin and what happens with the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. You know, Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And that ransom, the Jews missed that suffering part, I think, mm. for Messiah. Mm. They wanted Jesus as Messiah to become king, to kick out the Romans. But Paul and the others and Jesus said, didn't you realize Messiah had to suffer and die? So that epigonosco there may fit in a little bit, Joe. Another part or maybe aspect of the answer to that question, and I don't think anybody can really answer it totally, is that the, as Kermit was saying, the whole idea of a sin nature and inheriting a sin nature, it's not, it's not so clear. And it's one of the things that I think in my own understanding, coming to the truth of the one God and the man Christ Jesus that I've rethought some and I'm not so sure that Augustine as he formulated the ideas of the sin nature it's one of the things I kind of look at and say hmm not so sure he's getting it right the Jews for instance have a, a different idea on sin and sin nature than typical Christianity has had and th there are places in in the Bible that describe Jesus as growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So he grew in wisdom. And the book of Hebrews says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. So yes, Jesus is innocent, right? Very clearly, Pilate says it about five times in the gospel. Says, the man's in innocent, yeah. So we can see that we can understand from the gospel narrative that Jesus is who we needed. And just exactly how he's overcoming sin uh, in ways that I think we can learn as well. God has equipped him in unique ways. Joe was talking about the word there, unique. Being, having the, the spirit without measure. Mm. And I'm sure there were, there were ways in which Jesus was more sensitive to the Father's leading and obedient. Mm -hmm. And we come to understand these things, but he was, I think, enable, he, he was able to do that better than us. But uh, to me, it comes back to the verse that Kermit and Joe, I think, too, um, referred to. And I just have open here, Romans chapter 5, mm -hmm. which is one of the best explanations, mm -hmm. I think, in the New Testament of the necessity that Jesus is a human being. Romans chapter 5, 15 is a good example. But the gift is not like the trespass. And he's going to compare Adam with Jesus. For if many died 
through one man's trespass. This is another aspect, Kermit, is the penalty of sin passed on to mankind. I'm not so sure about the nature idea, but, mm -hmm. but I know whether the penalty, that is death, mm -hmm. passed on to mankind. Yes. So that's the, if many died through one's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the gift in the grace of that one man, Christ Jesus, abounded for many. So the penalty of death came upon us, but the gift of life through Jesus Christ comes on us. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. fantastic. Amen. Um, it concerns a temptation, and I'm going, I've studied Matthew chapter 4 vigorously. And according to the account in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was baptized, Yahweh told John the Baptist that when he came out of the, the, the river Jordan, that he would see a dove alight on him. And I believe that when John the Baptist witnessed, he was the first human being to witness a baptism by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, it says that that very Spirit drove him out into the desert. Yahweh did not ask Jesus why the, the Spirit drove him out into the desert. When he was out there, he went without food and water for 40 days. And when a human being is very dead, they are their weakest and most vulnerable. So not only was he sincerely tempted, but he was tempted at his lowest point when he was the most weakest and most vulnerable. And that was the litmus test. So I think what Yahweh expects of us is if my son can go without food and water for 40 days and be at his weakest and survive temptation, then we can, we can resist it on our, on our own living conditions. That's um, a good point, it says, Scott. It says that after the temptation that he was in such a condition that the angels had to minister to him. So that, that was such a yeah, I just love that verse. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So, you know, my excuse for stealing the dollar out of my mother's purse was candy. I just loved candy. Yeah. So Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. It, it had to be by the Holy Spirit. Exactly, Scott. The Holy Spirit, without measure, Jesus opens his whole life up. And when the Father says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased, Jesus' total submission to the will of the Father, I think, is the key to receiving more of the Spirit. Yeah, man, yeah. But he was also a son of God. And, and so that's why he could represent both sides. Uh, uh, Pastor Timothy. But uh, that's why. I, well, just, just that verse that says, he was tempted in every point as we are yet without sin, you know, means that he, he was a human being. The, the whole notion of mere man, I think the, the Latin or Greek is philanthropos, P S I L anthropos, just a man. No, he wasn't just a man. He was a man totally. March told me not to yell. <laughs> Jesus was a man totally dedicated to the will of God. He submitted in every way to his father. Father, not my will, but thine be done. And I think that's a major deal for a human being. And I think that's the example. Jesus set the example. So... 
we in our stupidity don't have to fall into these temptations that are all around us, but we have a way out now. I like that, way out. You were going to read something? Uh, Joe, I, I get pushback sometimes uh, when I go and say something like that. Uh, Jesus was just like us. Um, and so, you know, I'm open to using other words, other language, but what I'm trying to just express is that Jesus was fully human. Um, the main verse that we're referring to here is over there in Hebrews 2, verses 17. I'll read it here. Uh, speaking of Jesus, the author says, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect. Now, whether you understand that as his spiritual brothers and sisters or his physical brothers and sisters, it's still, the author is saying he had to be like the rest of us human beings. It's just that Jesus did not have sin, and we've got sin. That's what I'm trying to express. Good point. Very good. I sometimes like to, uh, on occasion, have a discussion about this, and I ask people, so do you think that Jesus considered sinning? And they want to say no. <coughs> of course, but the very definition of temptation <coughs> is that he considered it and turned it down. Yeah. Mike, mention that on your mind. For the sake of those who might not have heard that, the spell. I'm not sure it's on. Of being tempted is to consider sin. Did Jesus consider sinning? Yeah, it's a real dilemma for the deity of Christ world. If they think that this is actually God, that Jesus is God. You know, can he sin? Did he not? Was he tempted? It's, a, it's more of a dilemma, actually, I would say, Joe, for, for that perspective. Then you have, it's like, this is God. Satan says, here, I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth. <laughs> That's not a temptation. I'd laugh at Satan and say, who are you? Get out of here. I'm God. It's, like, it's not a temptation at all. That's why they have to almost say that he really wasn't tempted. Maybe in his human nature. You've got to go to this hypostatic union again. Totally unbiblical idea. One of the things that I wanted to bring up this morning, since this is Sunday school hour, Pastor Steve, <laughs> I want to encourage all of us to seriously look at Deuteronomy 6, 4 and following. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ehad. If answer and were here, I was going to have him, the seven-year-old, say that, but the following verses, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And then, what are we supposed to do with that information? Dalina, teach it to your kids when they lie down, when they rise up, when they're sitting at the table, and when you're walking along with them. Okay, and Joe Myers was always talking about the 10,000 hours thing. Pick that up from who, Joe? Malcolm Gladwell talked about if you got 10,000 hours, you could be a, a genius in a subject. So if you spent an hour a day, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, 15 minutes at lunch, 15 minutes when you're walking, in three years, you would have 1,000 hours. So in 10 years, you would have taught that child to be a, a genius on the one true God and his love for you and you, you know, our love towards him. So we, as believers, and, and I'm, I'm reflecting on my situation growing up, I didn't do that enough. I didn't pray enough with my kids, Jeremy and Jennifer. I didn't pray enough. I didn't talk enough. And so I'm, I just want to encourage, and trying to get out of guilt, thank God for grace. But now let's look at the situation. How can we encourage it? Teach it to our kids. And Chad did a good thing with his kid. He taught him the Shema, to love God. So we need to be promoting 
the real father. Malachi 2.10. Don't we all have one father? Hasn't one God created us? 1 Corinthians 4, 6. But to us, there's one God, the Father. And then there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So we need to be promoting the true God and the true, true Messiah, Bill. <laughs> true Messiah. I'm glad to hear that there are Messianic believers in Israel. I really am. Um. scholars the issue and because it is the best way to maintain his good work and continue on with his mission after he's been resurrected is by being the best role models we can be not only to children but the entire community we're, Amen. we're an example we're his ambassadors how they're, they're going to view our heavenly father and Jesus and their great work is by how how we behave and what they need to see is that Yahweh is the center of our lives and the way we show our love for him is by treating other human beings with the same grace and mercy and dignity that he's shown to us. Amen. That Amen. That reminds me of the verse that uh, it says John always told you, seek first the kingdom of God. And they stop there. And don't, or if they say, and his righteousness, they don't emphasize it. And uh, Righteousness so that yeah. we are that light to the world. Absolutely. If it didn't come on the microphone, I'll repeat it for Paul. Paul says, not only do you have priority in the Deuteronomy passage, but Jesus sets a priority in Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, I... Funa Fanani, Afumu Wamalungu, you know, Chichewa. We deal with all these churches in Malawi, and they understand that kingdom concept. To seek the Father and His righteousness and the kingdom, and all this other stuff will work out. All this other stuff will work out. Kermit, we're getting pretty close to time. Close this out uh, with some. Well, two minutes of good I, thought. I, uh, I would like to say something uh, to pick up on what Bill and I were talking about yesterday. Uh, what does it look like the future is mm -hmm. about our belief in the one God, Jesus being our Lord and Savior, but he's not God, compared to almost all other Christians who are taught the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, Jesus is God. What does the future look like on this? Uh, the question about whether or not Jesus is God is what the church argued about in the fourth century mm -hmm. and came to this conclusion that Jesus is God, God is three persons, etc. After that, there was no discussion about it. It was absolutely accepted, and that's the way it went for many centuries. Uh, then came about enlightenment, uh, literary criticism, which was applied to the Bible, and therefore biblical criticism. Uh, from out of biblical criticism came a, uh, uh, a group called the History of Religion, uh, that happened for about 40 years. I think it was in about 1880 to 1920. F.C. Bauer was kind of the head of it. Mm. It wasn't an actual school. It was a group of scholars. Uh, most of them were in Germany. I think some of them were in England. And they were questioning this whole thing about Christians believing Jesus is God. That's not all of what they were questioning, but it was a big part of it. And so uh, from out of that came the quest for the historical Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, Schweitzer's book in 1906 is regarded in the academy as the number one uh, Christian theological book produced in the 20th century. 
Um, <clears throat> and so this kind of uh, started off this quest for the historical Jesus among scholarship. And this went into three stages over a period, uh, well, the whole 20th century. Um, now it's kind of died down a little bit, uh, but the, the upshoot of it was, there's a difference between the synoptic gospels, that's the thir first three uh, gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's a difference between those three and the Gospel of John. And so these scholars were saying uh, there's a lot of actual history in the Synoptic Gospels about Jesus that we can trust. So it's reliable. But the Gospel of John, no way. That book is fiction. And so they believed the same thing that the church had believed for over a thousand years that the Gospel of John teaches very clearly that Jesus is God. And the, the scholars in the quest for their historical Jesus, but going back before that, the scholars <coughs> in the history of religion school, they all said this, absolutely, the Gospel of John is a totally different book from the Synoptic Gospel, so much so that it can't possibly represent the real Jesus who lived back there 2,000 years ago. Um, and so this has been the position. Uh, now, it was based uh, as from the perspective of those scholars that, um, that said, no, the Gospel of John, you can't trust it at all. Uh, and they said, no, Jesus certainly was not God. So that book is all wrong. It says Jesus is God, and no, he wasn't. Um, and so they, uh, uh, this perspective was based on the dating of the Gospels. It was accepted that Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, were created, were uh, written in the 70s and 80s, but the Gospel of John was written in the second century, hmm. uh, maybe clear into the middle of the second century. Now, uh, you know, we would refer to these as liberal scholars. They don't, meaning they don't see the Bible like we do. We see the Bible as fully inspired by God. They don't see it that way at all. The Bible's got all kinds of mistakes in it. It was, uh, uh, you know, it, these books were created by human beings. It goes on and on like this. And so they said that the Gospel of John was created much later when this whole idea of developing this Christology about Jesus took place. And so they would say, yeah, in the Synoptic Gospels, this is, this is the, the more of the real Jesus here, and the early Christians didn't believe Jesus was God. But later on, Christians did. And that is true, that in time, Christians began to be taught that Jesus was God in the second, third, and the fourth, fourth century. century. And so, but now there's a change going on about this. Amen. This has been very accepted that the Gospel of John was the last of the books of the Bible written. Uh, you know, those uh, scholars in the history of religion school, they said it was uh, written in the second century, but that didn't hold up. And so in the quest for the historical Jesus, uh, during the 20th century, scholars have believed, well, the Gospel of John was written last. It was probably written in the 90s. Yeah. And this whole development of Christology, we can accept that that happened uh, when the book was written that late, uh, saying that Jesus is God. But now there's a change going on. Amen. Uh, I'm reading uh, Stanley Porter has got two chapters. Uh, one book, um, I can't think of it right now, but he's got two chapters and two books that have just come out. Uh, he's a top scholar, New Testament scholar, and he's questioning uh, the Gospel of John being written after 70 AD. Mm -hmm. And so he's, uh, it looks like he's accepting that the Gospel of John was written before 70 AD, and he, uh, in this one chapter, He's going through all the writings of John A.T. Robinson, 
which I mm -hmm. uh, mentioned in my book, uh, mm -hmm. that he comes, uh, he and I believe exactly alike about, you know, Jesus mm -hmm. uh, was a man and not God. And so uh, this is a movement that's going on in the academy that is being more and more accepted that the Gospel of John might have been written before 70 AD. And one of the, the biggest uh, arguments for all of the books of the New Testament being written before 70 AD, which is what I believe, nothing is said about in those books about the destruction Temple. of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans. Let me, let me just, you know, I've been going to school. <laughs> Much learning hath made me mad. <laughs> or but glad. if you look at the modern <laughs> scholarship of James Dunn, Christology in the Making, it was a process not until the fourth century did they come up with the, sorry, Louisiana term, gobbledygook of the creedal system. And you look at Larry Hurtado, who is looking very intensely at that first century, what did they believe? And Bowers, you know, the majority of Christians believe like we do, Kermit. According to Bauer, the Ebionites and the Nazareans and the, you know, just the basic ones who followed the way in the book of Acts, they believe the simplicity of the scripture. And I think that's right on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was preaching. Any closing I'm, thoughts? You uh, know, I'm the one that's the clock watcher here. Oh, okay. You guys have gone beyond your Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> shut, so us, we, shut us down. We do appreciate all that's been said and shared. One quick question. Okay. Uh, is there a reference to Jesus or any of the things that happened to him in the writings of Josephus? I yes, he refers, a, 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 they call that extra biblical. So Tacitus refers, Josephus refers to those Christians, and so Christus, followers of Christus, so there are some extra biblical uh, references was to. There a reference about the crucifixion or anything like that? Yes, he was killed. Yeah. I thought so. Okay, thank you very much, men. We have appreciated having you this morning. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Short break before church starts at 10 30.